Hi, Anita. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, it's so nice to be here. I'm so excited for this. Yeah, I I didn't actually get to meet you at the Dallas conference, but I did see that you were there with the book signing and was really, really excited to reach out to you eventually because one of the things I feel like um, I get asked a lot from women who, especially women who are diagnosed in adulthood, which is like, how do I get my husband to explain or to understand my point of view uh, and what I'm actually struggling with and how do I articulate all that? And there seems like there's books that are about how to live with a person with ADHD written for a non adhd -er, but not a lot of books that are like, how do we communicate as people with ADHD? So I'm really excited to kind of ask you and pick your brain about all of that. Um, but so you were diagnosed in childhood, correct? No, actually, um, it was about 10 years ago when I was getting my clinical license and I was like going over the diagnostic criteria and uh, you know, I was like looking at it and they're like, oh, you don't diagnose everybody and yourself and your family and stuff. And I was like, oh, I mean, like, this is so obvious. And I mean, a lot of my like um, male family members as kids were diagnosed, but none of really the female ones were. So I knew ADHD was a part of our family, but it was really, yes, I, I looked at the diagnostic criteria when I was going over this. And so that was about 10 years ago. And then um, I had a therapist at the time for something else. And so we talked about that and kind of went through the process and started to kind of like, oh, this makes sense, this makes sense um, type deal. So it was it was sort of through grad school, I guess, that I, I led me to get a diagnosis. Uh -huh. Okay. And so what was happening? Was it the was it the studying itself or it was really just sort of seeing these patterns laid oh, out? For it you? was just like looking at their criteria. And I was like, oh, well, that that this this is totally me. This is totally like everybody in my family. And I think like I, you know, being a part of the field and kind of being more immersed in it now um, and working with predominantly like ADHD clients, it's it's been really interesting for me to think about why some of my experience with ADHD is different. I, um, I definitely had some like anxiety that after I realized the diagnosis that I was kind of like making me stressing out over keys and stuff like that. And my now husband at the time, he's like, you're so chill but like in the morning it's like whoa like over like these little things like that helped me kind of switch from using like anxiety to get my executive functioning systems going to like other ones but I don't I think I was really lucky in the fact that probably because a lot of my family members probably for generations have had ADHD that I got a lot of really healthy environments for ADHD so like I had created a, a lot of systems that like now I know why they work, but I was I was pretty good overall with kind of how um, I had my life set up, how I was getting my sensory needs met um, until until motherhood came, and that that was like a whoa um, that that really kind of made me do a little bit more research, and that's how I started bringing the ADHD part into couples counseling because I was really hyper focused on couples counseling. That was my thing. I loved it. I loved being a couples counselor. And because I was struggling with some of these executive functioning challenges with ADHD, I like when I was going to these massive conferences, I would sneak in for my own like benefit. And then it was kind of like, oh, all of a sudden having these two like learning opportunities made me realize oh, there's a lot of stuff missing in couples counseling. Like, where is that couples counseling that's ADHD friendly? And so that's sort of how I um, came up in this journey of like recognizing where my, um, how my ADHD was impacting my life. And then also kind of all these gifts, which are really thrown into my book of like, okay, what is it that makes this environment for ADHD thrive? What is it about these relationships that make it, um, not so much of like, uh, it, make it less challenging, I guess, and make it get all the good stuff from ADHD. And so that's sort of where um, I, I started writing the book. I started creating these courses just to get that knowledge out there. Um, and it's, I guess that's how it's sort of related to my journey too. But I think, um, I think I just got really lucky of having kind of this generational wisdom and these experiences um, from like my grandma who, who got this stuff figured da out, um, from my uncle who was like worked in outward bound for over 30 years and was just like the most amazing uncle. And I got to do outward bound, like a lot of 
outdoor education. And then also because I was attracted to a lot of these fields, like I got a lot of good learning and environments for ADHD just because of the opportunities that I had. Um, and so I think, I think that's like a, a difference in my story um, that not a lot of people have. And so that's kind of made me really curious of like, okay, what is it that's going on? What, you know, what are the things that we can change and modify? So that way we can really talk about it with, the non-ADHD partner with the ADHD or, and also put some accountability to where the environment is. Cause I really think the U S is like, and I've lived abroad a lot. <laughs> so like the U S is really bad for ADHD <laughs> and that's just really unfortunate. I'm like, we don't have to struggle so much. Um, but it's not really our fault. A lot of it is really the system's fault. And I think holding that accountability and, and working within relationship systems can make these small changes that can open up so many more possibilities because when you feel safe in a relationship, when you feel supported in a relationship, when you realize like life doesn't have to always be like this, then it's really, it's a lot easier to advocate for yourself in the workplace or with friends or, you know, just kind of setting yourself up for success because you know what it feels like. Yeah. Right. I think, um, you know, one of the things, when I was first diagnosed, it was really difficult for me to articulate for myself how much did I struggle and how much of this is just normal struggling uh, or, you know, uh, in terms of adult, you know, motherhood and um, school and all of these sort of catalysts where my ADHD was worse as I looked back over the course of my life and being like, how, what, you know, how much did I struggle? And you talking about the frantic morning and the keys reminded me of when I was diagnosed, my doctor was asking me, you know, I sort of feel like a diagnosis is really not about what the problem is. It's how elaborate your system is to deal with the problem. And, and I remember um, you know, she was talking to me about, do I feel like I lose things? And I was like, no, I don't think I lose things. I don't feel like I'm very absent-minded. And, but then I went into this whole long tirade about like all the different ways that I don't lose my keys and all the, the specific hooks that I have for certain things and everything has a place. And I have a set of glasses in every car and right by the TV. And like, I was going on and on and on about these systems that I had created. And she was like, you work really hard to not lose things. And I just wanted to cry because I thought, wow, like I, nobody's ever accused me of working hard before, right? Like it's, you know, it's those moments where you stop and be like, oh, here's a really concrete example of how hard I've been treading water, right? And, and you know, so many of us had that feeling of like, oh, like there's so much happening behind the scenes that people don't see. Um, and, and, you know, and then you bring that into the relationship dynamic too, which is like, I think one of the things, uh, that really changed for me with my relationship after my diagnosis was being able to, you know, I felt like I focused a lot on all the things I wasn't doing and all the things I was so that my partner was doing and always feeling so bad about the fact that I wasn't able to do those things, or he was always like doing so much. And, and I was never paying any attention to what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I was like, why is that? And I, I feel like there were so many, you know, I think it's more interesting for us to pay attention to what we're not doing than what we are doing. Uh, you know, I think it's, that's, it's a problem to be solved. Right. So I think if, if something's effortless, we don't pay any attention to it. We're like, yeah, 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 that's fine. So I like, I really want to fix, um, what I'm not bringing to the table as opposed to really paying attention to like, oh, I'm actually doing a lot and really, you know, a fabulous partner. <laughs> like that reframe was so important. Um, and I think I see that a lot with women who are just mm -hmm. like, feel like, like you said, like, I think that's a uniquely Western, um, attitude in terms of how we're socialized. Like men are socialized to have built in support systems. They are socialized to have their mothers and their wives and secretaries. And so they have, they rely on support systems from birth. Whereas women are taught to be the support system. We're taught to like, figure it out, do this. You've got to do this alone. And if you're going to ask for help, you have to have tried everything else before you get to the point where you ask for help. Like, you know, I think that that's something very unique to our, you know, Protestant work ethic, Western culture of like asking for help is basically failure for women a lot of the times. Yeah, I think uh, it's, yeah, that pull yourself up by your bootstraps, individual, like, you know, it's all on you. It's just so harmful and it makes it so challenging. Because um, when I work with, I think, younger, like, clients in their 20s, they don't seem to have as much of this like internalized ick <laughs> around like using 
the different tools and learning and growing and you know they have just such a wonderful language around mental health and needs and boundaries that that I feel like my generation and older and the older you get the harder it is to kind of break down those barriers of like no I have to do it by myself or I need to do these things and that um, you know, that takes away that community support. It takes away body doubling. It takes away just all of this stuff. And it's, it's interesting because you are like working really hard on systems to like fit in. And I'm like, oh, no, like I just <laughs> avoided. I was like, okay, I hate, I don't want to lose my keys. Okay, we'll get a little keypad lock and then I'll just not have a car. I was like, <laughs> I was key free and I was like the happiest I've ever been in my life. You know, I was biking everywhere. I didn't have to ever worry about keys. I was like, this is the best thing ever. I never bought anything because you know, like I, I don't even have like a ring because, you know, for various reasons, but I don't want to lose it. Like, you know, I learned, I just don't like losing things. So I'm just not going to have stuff. And then when I became a mom, all of a sudden it was like, here's all these things. And yes, that expectation is like, you know, where it is like me and my husband, we, we were, we worked really well together. And then all of a sudden it was like, Hey, where should I put this? Where should I put this? Where should I put this? And now in our relationship, he's the one who decides where to put it. Cause I'm like, yeah, this is, this is the work of my brain. But we had like a couple years of just struggle and learning and readjusting, not only as being parents. And I also think one of the most challenging countries to be a parent, um, just because of the lack of social support, um, that is nowhere else in the world. Um, so you have, you have that already, but then you also just have kind of like all of my coping mechanisms that worked really well for me. I just lost along with like, I had a lot of physical postpartum issues that I still deal with today. So I also lost this ability to get my sensory needs met, like to be physically active. Um, because I was a very, very active person before I, um, had a kid and I imagined my life as a mom being very active. Like I was active with kids. I took them like on, you know, wilderness <laughs> trips. Like, you know, I'm like, I got this motherhood thing. Like, you know, I can, I can run a camp with like a hundred kids. Like this is, this is going to be easy. Um, but yeah, it was really, that's where I really felt the impact of my ADHD because like, I, I was lucky enough to have enough supports, I think, to, to have systems that worked for me before I became a mom. But like exactly what you're talking about, then all of this you know, all these internalized messages, even though we really wanted to be an equitable household and not follow like gender norms, like they just all creep in and all of these things. And it's so disorienting. You have, um, you know, like you're not sleeping, <laughs> like all the things <laughs> happen all at once. And like, you know, I, there wasn't pre-baby counseling in the beginning, but I kind of created our own and I really, we were really so proactive about it. It was, it was hard to kind of realize that like, whoa, like, there is something bigger than us going on and we need to kind of figure it out. And that's sort of, I think where, you know, I, I had to do a deeper dive. I'm like, okay, what are the systems of managing stuff? Like I can't just not have stuff, you know, I can't not have bottles unless I want to breastfeed all the time, which, you know, I like a break. So, so, um, and that's where I actually decided to, to get on medicine and had a wonderful experience with my doctor, but I definitely felt like a lot of those things where it's like, oh, I'm a practitioner. I should know these things. I don't know. You know, like these weird messages that I must've internalized as a kid. Like I don't want medicine for some reason. And when I, when I talked about it, like a decade ago, like I felt like I was like, good, this made sense. You know, I don't think I really need any help. Um, other than like having the knowledge and kind of understanding like certain things. But at that point, like I'd already been in, I've already had like so many work experiences that were just like, now I realize it. Um, or now all my friends know we just had ADHD all over the place. So it's like, I never felt like I wasn't normal. I wasn't getting like negative feedback, like most other people were. And, um, you know, and like, yeah. So, and I had like these systems that really, now that I understand a lot more of it, that were working for me that just were not compatible when I had a kid in the mm. USA. Yeah. One thing I noticed when I started interviewing women was I, I started noticing a big difference between women who received some sort of diagnosis in childhood of a learning mm -hmm. disorder, uh, because so many of us are diagnosed with, uh, you know, uh, dyslexia or dysgraphia or uh, some kind of learning disorder where it was instilled in them in an early age that they was, there was nothing wrong with them, right? That there was, that you just needed support. You needed help. You needed something different. And then those of us who were not diagnosed with any learning disorders 
took on that assumption of like, I have to figure this out on my own. This is my problem. I'm not trying hard enough. I'm not studying hard enough or all the things that we're doing wrong. And then we get diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. But I was like, it was, there was something about that that found really different in terms of um, just our self-concept. Right. And how like being able to instill in kids, like you said, this new generation of kids who are able, better able to advocate, um, I see, you know, 20, I, I see 20 year olds in my grad school courses and I'm just, my jaw drops listening to how well they are able to advocate for themselves in the classroom in a way that I'm, you know, I still can't do, or, you know, I still fall into that category where they're like, this email was not clear. You need to explain this to a professor. And I'm like, are you allowed to talk to a professor like that? <laughs> like, um, and, you know, and just these moments where I'm like, go you, uh, it is really, it's really, um, it's encouraging because I think it really comes down to, like you said, like really feeling like I'm not the problem here. Uh, mm-hmm. If something's not working for me, I, we need to fix the system around that. Um, exactly. But how- and I think that's really, I think that's so important to understand. Cause I, I, you know, like in that sense of like when I was a camp director, like, I, I emailed out what me and a colleague who are working on my online course uh, or my online courses, he's, he definitely has ADHD. We sent out like this YouTube video that we did of just us talking about camp and how it was so ADHD friendly and how it was so like executive function supportive. And then like my other, you know, I, I had like maybe four, four or five different, like, uh, you know, uh, assistant directors. Like there's so many people who are then like, oh, I have ADHD too. Oh, I have ADHD too. And I'm like, oh, right. This makes sense. But like having these experiences where there's environments out there seeing like everybody and like this is including kids and young adults and staff that have this environment where everybody's thriving. Um, And I think it's really important for people to see what that looks like, because I don't think a lot of people know what that looks like. And I also think, you know, that's one of the reasons I was attracted to like um, couples counseling was that we don't see what healthy relationships look like. Right. We don't see what that type of communication looks like, um, at least for us in the millennial and up generation. Um, and and I think there's just such an awareness of seeing it modeled um, because it's so hard to fathom if you don't know what what it, like that it exists. And so you definitely have and I see that, too, with my clients. Um the ones that tend to have had less of that negative impact and struggles. Um, and I, and I have like three or four categories of what I see of, of, um, like, yes, the, the diagnosis, um, a lot of times they were like athletes, like star athletes. So they got a lot of sensory input structure and then just a lot of praise. They, you know, like at least in my high school, nobody could touch the football player, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. you know, like they didn't have any rules essentially. Cause you know, like, <laughs> You know, uh, deities in in the U.S. or Midwest in Texas, <laughs> and um, and so it's interesting because you definitely see, like, when I work with couples or individuals, you see such a difference because, like, we're not working through so much of the trauma, and like, there's a lot of overlap of trauma and ADHD or just neurodivergence in general because it's just been such a harmed group, um, and like blamed and all this crap that's given given to us. Um, but I think it's also really important to look at what are, but then when, when are people thriving and what does that look like and how do we integrate that in? And that's why I think it's so important within the relationships when you, when you change that, when you get that secure attachment, when you get your needs met, that is, it's kind of like, you know, your parent child relationship, right? Like that is your base as an adult, you get that, then you can go over and conquer the world, right? You know, type deal. And so I do think there is a huge impact and, such importance, and I try to bring so much celebration and 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 um, like helping clients and couples or relationships understand the power that they have to make these changes. Because when they might be getting frustrated that like things aren't getting put away, or you're forgetting like you know the kids' doctor's appointments or whatever it is, um, there's also this other part of the the non ADHD partner that also really like you know cares for this person and loves this person and understands that they were hurt truly like growing up all the time and so when you can hold both and kind of heal that part it's so amazing to see like how transformative that is and that I think that is like my hope you know and that I love the I love the how TikTok and other like social media has been able to give a lot more representation and, and model that in such a short amount of time that I do think is like 
you know, from when I wrote the book to now, I'm like, wow, like nobody even knew the word like neurodiversity. And when I was like looking at it, I was like, oh, I think the technical term in my book should be neurodivergence or neurodivergent, but like nobody was using it at the time. And now like all this other stuff is there. And I'm like, wow, that got outdated really fast. And that's wonderful. Like I, I love that. And um, I love celebrating because that's such a better way for the ADHD brain to get on that journey versus like that negative self-talk that that becomes a barrier that so many women in particular struggle with because of the gender messages and then kind of just being in the U.S. and that individualism. Like it's like not doing things by yourself is a very unique U.S. thing. Living on your own is a very unique U.S. thing. Like like the lack of supports that you are talking about is something that's like unique to hear. And now that my kid is going to public school, like I'm remembering all this stuff about public school. That's like, what are we doing? And um, I, I, I really wish they had so much more outdoor time and recess time. And so I was like doing like this research of all this stuff, like from 2013, like a decade ago of how recess is important. And even in Japan, which is like, you know, generally known of like a very ordered on time schedule, they get a recess break, outdoor break every 15 minutes. Like, I mean, it's just, we are just so far on the, let's not make this ADHD friendly at all spectrum um, in so many regards that it is, it is really frustrating, but it doesn't mean um, that we can't change. And I think that knowing and learning and, and seeing examples of that, whether it's in the U S like um, or outside is really important. So that way people can understand like how that, that change is possible. And that some of these things that people have told themselves to protect themselves, right. From negative feedback or criticism or making a mistake you know, if we can let go of that and mourn that, because that's that's grief, right? That that once you recognize how hard it's been, that's a, and how traumatic it's been, and how you were really probably abandoned as a kid because you were so alone in it. I mean, that's pretty sad. So, like being able to get and accept and move through that process, which also we're not taught how to do very well. <laughs> um, you know, like just push it away. We don't want to be sad. I, I think that really allows then a lot of of using like the growth mindset of using these five pillars that I talk about in my book because the editors when I was writing it were like executive function, executive function, executive function, and I'm like, wow, this is really depressing. Like, I love me. I would, I would, I would want to be with me. Like, I wouldn't want to be with me the way that they're making me write the book. Um, so I was like, we okay, we got to change something. I, we got to, we got to add this because it's like it's really more. I think. That, and that's where I came up with the five pillars that I started using then in the boot camps and stuff that I was already doing. But it was really that like, hey, we need a guide. We need a template because if not, it just feels so cumbersome of like, well, your brain can't do this. Well, you can't do this very well. Or this is challenging for you. And this, you know, of explaining it to like a non ADHD person, whether it's a parent. It, it didn't ever give any action item. It didn't ever give anywhere any way to support that. And it. And it honestly, because I'm so into now the sensory processing fields and combining that, um, you know, because I do think these two fields should be combined occupational therapy and mental health in a lot of ways. Um, our executive functioning is so different because our brains and bodies are wired so differently. And that's why it makes it very um, counterintuitive, right? It, does, it doesn't make sense a lot of the times because why can we do all these things in one environment and not in the other. And so when we have this guide of like, okay, this is what makes an environment. This is what makes your brain work well. Like that's life changing. And I, and I also feel like, uh, like I made this video of what you're saying or talking about, about losing keys and running late. Like I was solo parenting for a few weeks. Um, and we had the Texas freeze, at least in Austin, like everything shut down. Like people lost power. I mean, people lost power for weeks, no school. It was, a, it was a disaster. And so, like, all of our systems are off. Everything's, like, discombobulated. And I am there. Go I don't normally do morning drop-off. And, like, I'm like, wow. Whoa. <laughs> look at I was like, wow, this is kind of – I forgot how, like, running late is kind of fun. You know? Like, in the sense of, like – because my kid and I are just like, I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's go. You know, like, okay, green light. Ah, 
red light. Like we, like there was so much energy and, and we did, we were only late once <laughs> that week after the storm because we're, our whole schedule was like, he was going to bed late. Like we were watching way too many screens. Like it was just such a mess. And it was like this reminder of like, wow, how much my life has changed since becoming a parent and be getting these skills, you know, knowing when I need to take medicine, knowing how to meet my sensory needs, like all of this stuff, like I feel like a different person and that I got this reminder and I'm like, oh yeah, this is why it's fun. <laughs> I mean, it's stressful and there's consequences, but like, it is like a video game, right? <laughs> like, you know, in some ways where there's a lot of like, you know, uh, there's just a lot of stuff and sensory stuff going on. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is, this totally makes sense. This is why I used to do it like this. And this is why a lot of people kind of figured this out. And, you know, and when I did drop off last year in the morning, I also realized that I was doing that with my kid. Cause he's like, oh no, we're late. Ah, we're late. And I'm like, we got, we got plenty of time. What are you talking about? He's like, it's fun to say it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Like seeing your coping strategies when your kid mirrors it back to you, you're like, huh, all oh, right, that's some good information there. I wonder, I wonder like if I need to change something or if this is okay, you know? <laughs> so. Oh my gosh, that's, I love that. I, you know, it's funny because I, I had never even heard the term executive functioning until after I was diagnosed with ADHD and was sort of, you know, inducted into this world of learning disorders and learning more about what executive functioning and dysfunction was. And it was so, it was crazy because I feel like so much of this diagnosis is learning this language around what is happening and why. And, and I think, you know, from my experience was like, especially when it comes to sensory processing, like, you know, sleep deprivation, a new baby crying all the time, the, the sensory sensory issue of breastfeeding and not wanting to be touched and all of that. And like, like there's so much happening. And, and I think you're just in the constantly feeling like you're, you know, I was always feeling like I was treading water, not realizing why I was so emotionally dysregulated and why I was, you know, yelling at my husband all the time and my kids and then feeling terrible because everybody was walking on eggshells. And, and so it's like all of this looking back now, it's like realizing, okay, why I, I call it like having notes in the margin, right. Or just seeing these road signs as they're happening now and developing this language around like, oh, the reason why I am feeling dysregulated, even the term emotional dysregulation wasn't a term mm -hmm. I ever would have used. And now I use it all the time because I'm like, I need to regulate myself or I'm feeling dysregulated, right? Because it's like, oh, like I start to see things before they get to a fever pitch and I'm able to say, okay, there's the TV's on. Let's not have this conversation with this other noise, you know, or all of this stuff where it's like, how can I, you know, lower my sensory? But I, I was not like, I think that's so many of us are not equipped to even mm. understand. We don't have that language. Um, and I'm like, why aren't they teaching this at school? Why are they teaching, you know, they're teaching home ec, but you know, I felt like it would have been really, really helpful. And also like you were saying with executive functioning, there's that feeling of so much shame around it because of that internalized ableism that so many of us have, which is like, why am I being lazy, quote unquote, in this moment when I'm not in other moments? What's wrong with me? And then always going back to that idea of like, I can see myself doing it. I can see myself, I've done it other times. What's stopping me from doing it right now? And, and then having a partner who interprets that as, well, if you really cared about me, you would do these things. And then it's, and then you, you go back on yourself and you're like, well, do I not care about you? Am I a terrible person? Right. And so, <laughs> right. Like I, so I understand like, yes, I, I understand like if we focus too much on the like, you know, executive function element, you know, I've so many women who get diagnosed and they're so excited because they're like, I finally found out what's wrong with me. Fix me. And then it's, I have to be like, spoiler alert, you know, you're, you're not going to get fit. Like there's no, you don't need to be fit, right? Sari Soldin who says like only furniture and dogs get fixed. Um, um, but I think it's really this idea of like, oh, I'm so excited to find out what's wrong with me. So how do I fix that? And I feel like that narrative around uh, that narrative around executive function, I think could be really, really yeah. harmful. Um, but and, I want to get back to, okay. I want to get back to the five ADHD pillars. Cause I really feel like that's interesting, but you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to say, but that's what I tell with my clients, like time and time again, I was like, make your environment work for you, work with your brain, you know? And so when you understand how that works and we're still learning a lot, like, cause I, um, I took, because I have a lot of therapist friends, I took my kid to OT when he was two. Cause like, 
and and he didn't sleep through the night until he was three until he started occupational therapist and or, or occupational therapy and i was just like oh you know it's like he just like takes forever to fall asleep and he's like kicking his leg against the wall and they're like oh that's a sensory issue and then i'm like wait what and then i was like wait hold on I could have been sleeping like two years ago if somebody would have told me this. And I, and so like seeing that process and I used to be a school counselor and I was like, this is, I mean, like, I love the stuff that I did as a school counselor. And, but I also was like, oh my goodness, like every kid should have occupational therapy. Like this should just be part of it. And that's sort of where I started to um, make more sense of and do a lot more research. Cause I was like, there's, there's a lot of correlation in there. You know, all the research is like more research is needed. But when I was doing my presentation for Chad, like I, it was really fun to kind of go in and kind of look at like, okay, why are some of the interventions that I do that have a lot of sensory input that have a lot of executive functioning, like games and breakdown and colors and like all these things. Like, I mean, I'm taking the stuff that I used to work with kids and camps and things and making them fun for adults. Um, like, you know, my dream would be like outward bound, like relationship boot camp, you know, team building, that type of thing. Sticker charts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Like, sparkly fun, outdoor, getting your sensory needs met, which are not always sensory seeking. You have them on both ends. But it was really interesting to get a lot of the data of why these things are working and why these kind of pillars um, do are really formative and understanding. And um, even from when I wrote my book, like now I, I have so much more of this sensory input and so much more research that also explains why executive functioning goes up and down. And so when you know those information, when you know that information, information, then you could be in the driver's seat. Like you're in control versus like your dopamine praise needs trying to be met or your sensory needs being met. And so you're doing it differently and that's, and, and then you're so alone in it. And that's where that internalized dialogue tends to come. Cause that's how at least most women were, um, you know, socialized for And, and I will say this too, is that like, you know, having a son versus a, a daughter, I definitely see, even even though all of me and my friends are very, like, like, trying to not reinforce gender norms, like, they happen. Like, he, he, you know, like, he's the kid who was in music class. I'm like, where are all these kids? How can they just sit still and, like, pay attention? And he's, like, rolling around, climbing all over everything, doing all this stuff. And I'm just, but nobody would say anything, like, you know, or, like, if a girl hit another girl. But my kid, I'm, like, watching him so he doesn't, like, bite another kid. I'm, like you know, playing defense. And, and I never got as much, I think, um, negative feedback or he didn't get as much negative feedback, you know, as a kid. So I think it really starts at a young age of why girls still today get less diagnosed because they're socialized to be more, um, like, like, uh, have more inhibition, right. To, to, I guess, uh, in that sense, but then they don't, they're not getting it in the information in the way that they need, Right. And that's where that internalized dialogue comes. That's where kind of like that trauma based reactions that turn into like anxiety, binge eating, like a lot of other comorbidities, um, you know, and that's why also to like um, I just applied to do a few more conferences of trying to really help clinicians in all fields, like make things ADHD friendly and why it's an ethical issue, because there's so many medical providers, you know, not just in mental health that don't do this. And then they're adding trauma and harm because they're like, here's a whole bunch of instructions verbally without any follow up. And it, re it perpetuates this problem of not under not addressing the underlying issue. Right. Um, where like somebody's like, well, I just can't do it. <laughs> like, you know, because when I first took medicine, still like sleep deprived, all this stuff, I was like, oh, up. I thought I really read the instructions, but I was not supposed to eat. And then I'm like, I can't remember to take my medicine. And my doctor, like, I just adore him because he was so patient and like compassionate and like, just, you know, he's like, just put it where your toothbrush is. Can you brush your teeth? I'm like, yeah, I can, I can brush my teeth. And you know, like, it's just, it's just such a, a, a sweet spot because I was really struggling in that moment in my life. And it was very disorienting for all the things that you're talking about. of just like, balancing like going back to work and like being sleep deprived and like breastfeeding and like all of that stuff all of these things that like i've just never like that were all new like all my old systems were taken away and i had to learn new systems and it wasn't the time for me to learn new systems at all
Like, <laughs> you know, like you don't learn when you're sleep deprived. Like you don't learn when you're learning how to parent and what your baby needs. Like that, that is not the time you learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, it's just one curveball after another. You have no idea if your child is going to sleep for five minutes or three hours. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like impossible to plan. And I think planning is so, you know, feels safe or comforting. Uh, and, and you, it's just not possible. A lot of the time you really have to fly by the seat of your pants, which can be fun if, in, mm -hmm. if you're in the right frame of mind. <laughs> Oh, for sure. I mean, like if I was like running a daycare or something, if I would have thrown that energy and I had my team and we could be excited about it, like I think parenthood would be really easy. I just like what I do and I'm not ready to switch into that. No, <laughs> but, I, just... like, I, do, I do recognize that like even though I used to work with kids and I, I was I was way better working as kids than I am as a parent. Like, you know, I I definitely think I'm an amazing parent, um, but I also recognize that like, you know, my job, I loan out my nervous system. So therefore like my kid sometimes when he needs it, I don't have as much to give. And like, it's just, I'm exhausted. It's not like, this is my job. And then I get a break. It's like, I have my job and then I'm going and I don't have the energy because I didn't get all of those things growing up. I mean, I'm good at like certain things that I got growing up because I'm not learning them, you know, of like doing really fun adventures and like, you know, all these things, but like this other part of this executive functioning where my kid is really challenged, you know, of like putting on your clothes, brushing your teeth, taking a bath, like things I hate doing. Like I, and I never really got those skills. So it's like, I know what to do, but it's like, it's work. And so, I mean, it's a mixture and, and I'm still growing on that path, but, um, <laughs> You know, like I'm kind of balancing both of having compassion. I was like, hey, well, you're doing better than like what you got. And the other part of it is like, ooh, I know I'm contributing a little bit to both of our meltdowns um, at this moment. But <laughs> like, I know I could set your environment up for success a little bit more, but I need more bandwidth in order to do that too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the, yeah, and that's really helped me too to identify have developed that language again with my children. Cause I was always like, you know, I really relied a lot on repair with my kids when they were little be like, yeah, this is why I started screaming. Sorry. Um, but you know, now being able to really explain what's happening, uh, mm -hmm. even for them, I think it's, I, I feel like I am developing that language with them so that they're better able to understand who they are and what works for them and what doesn't, which mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for. Um, so the five ADHD pillars, can you walk us through yeah, what so that the five, is? The five ones that I use in my book um, and talk about and use with couples, um, but also really apply for parenting, for any type of relationship environment. So growth mindset. Um, so I do a lot of games to help with the trauma response, you know, of like, I failed, you learned. It's uh, some people say that that's, you know, they don't like that because it's too, too silly. Um, so this, but, but it's really embracing this culture of failure and learning. And I think you get, you see that in certain environments, like one of the schools that I did send my kid to, which are like the Acton schools, they really embrace growth mindset, even though they don't use that term. That's what it is. It's really embracing failure and um, learning and growing. And then you'll see that in other environments too, like an outdoor environments, theater, like when you have to learn how to embrace failure. And so I think um, ADHDers in that environment have a, have a lot of energy and creativity to give. And because of a lot of the internalized like ableism and messaging and just like the stuff, at least in the US that women get a lot, um, you know, that can be really, really challenging because um, Public school still is better, but like, you know, we, we have fixed mindsets everywhere, which is like, you're smart or you're dumb, you're productive or you're lazy, you know, like those types of things that uh, tend to come into our brain. But growth mindset really focuses on effort and growing and learning, which includes failing and trying like, um, in, in that process on the way with a lot of feedback. And so that's a really wonderful way for couples or individuals or school environments, um, which a lot more schools are embracing the growth mindset uh, because there's so much evidence that it's good for all brains. But I think for ADHD, it is a make or break. You know, it allows you to learn these new skills that you and I are talking about to embrace all of these things. And I think when I really just embraced failure and it's like, oh, it's okay, or I'm going to make it make a mistake, you know, and I think also being on more of an anti-racist journey the last few years and learning from that, I think that also has really solidified that of, um, of, of 
not being afraid to fail, of not being afraid to make a mistake, of knowing that like I, my nervous system doesn't feel as activated as it used to be. And that really feels freeing and liberating and like um, opens up so much. Um, and, and I think that also helps me be a better parent because like I'm not, I don't care if I make a mistake with my kid because I know that we're going to be on the journey together and I want him to see my mistakes. I want to learn and grow as a person. So the growth mindset is key. Um, so that's like the first one. And I have uh, that that's already up on my online course uh, of helping couples or individuals really embrace that. And then ADHD strategies that go along with growth mindset. And I'm probably going to go out of order of whatever is in my book. But the next part of the course that I'm working on that I'm really excited about is praise. And praise can look at like whatever it is. It's the reward. It's just a lot of people do like that good job because that's at least what my generation went with. And that's not really like great praise, but it is some like, acknowledgement and praise. So I think it's kind of working on what are your dopamine needs? Because when I would see clients, right, sometimes um, it's like you come in and you focus on the one area that isn't clean. And like, if you got excited, like, cause that's how they motivated themselves to clean the house. They're like, Ooh, my person's going to come in and they're going to be so excited and they're going to do this. And then they come in and they're like, Oh, that isn't clean. It is devastating because it took a lot of work. So knowing what your praise needs are. And I think that's another thing of knowing what they are. So you're in the driver's seat. Like, you know, when I look at back on my life and how I kind of chase some dopamine, like some of them were great decisions and other ones I'm like, oh wait, I could have done a way better job if I knew what, what I was needing. And two, like that also helps. Like, so like if I've ever felt low or I, I'm just like, I need you to tell me some nice things or, um, you know, like we, in my relationship, um, you know, it's a really wonderful thing to know how we feel connected and loved and cared for, but praise and it, it, praise is messy because we get a lot of mixed messages and like older generations are like, I don't need any praise that like, you know, makes it mean less, um, which is, I mean, which is valid because that is their experience, but then you're also not getting some type of need met. And with ADHD, praise, reward, that is what our brains need. And it, it is challenging for me as a parent sometimes because I'm like, I'm, I've been so ingrained, like, oh, intrinsic motivation. Like, you know, you don't want your kid to be able to do these things and really enjoy it. And I'm like, no, oh, if he wants to give himself a point for putting the towel, hand towel back, like he can give himself a point. If we need to give him points for being on time, doing those things, like, yeah. But then like, you know, like, cause that's how his brain works. But I also see myself sometimes struggle from those messages. So praise and learning what your praise needs are in a relationship go really well. And that also helps like, if you're needing something that's hard for the ADHD partner of using that type of recognition, celebration, that type of way of doing the hard stuff as they're learning things that are for the benefit of the other person or the relationship itself. Um, so I think that's one that uh, is really fun um, to do, but also like people like depending on what year you're born have different experiences with it. Um, so, and the next one is games uh, and games is really just like play. Um, and so making sure that there's play involved uh, in your relationship. There's novelty, there's challenge, there's like creativity. Uh, and and that's like, I mean, you can use that as two gamifying systems that work for you or your kids, but I think it's really important to uh, recognize that play is a need and that sometimes you need that before you can do the other stuff. And so at least in the US, it's like, do your work and then you can have fun. And, and that's not always the case. And a lot of times couples who haven't gotten this inf information, neurodiverse couples, the non-ADHD partner gets so frustrated because it's like they just want to play or they get to play with the kids and that's not what we're supposed to be doing. I'm doing all this stuff. And that's true, right? Like when you're, and, and it, and it can be the exec, it could, it can be the ADHD female that's taking on all the executive functioning and then they don't get to play anymore. They don't have any space for creativity and, and plays also for, you know, if we're referring to adults, you know, and couples, um, you know, it's also sex. That's where you get a lot of those play games, that type of thing met. Um, and so making sure that's a really important part and making sure that you can talk about things and also have play, humor, that type of connection. And um, when you see that with kids too, that is a great way for them to learn. That's where like my courses, the stuff I do, like workshops and in, in person before the pandemic, you know, I would just do a lot of challenges and games because that's how ADHD learns best. 
and that's why like video games can be really helpful for learning too, because you're, you're getting so much feedback and you're getting that novelty and you're getting that competition and all of those things. So games is just a really important need to have. Um, and I, and I, and I, uh, interchange them games play. The next one is positive uh, acceptance. So this is just like basic humanistic <laughs> psychology, right? Of just really embracing and loving the person for who they are. Um, coming from it from like a uh, place of care, you're a good person, like I see you and you can be whole, right? You can, you can have negative impacts. You can struggle in some areas and that's okay. So coming from like, I know that you're doing your best. I know that you love me. I just can see that you're trying, you know, that type of um, like secure attachment really is, is that positive acceptance of coming from that. And so when when couples, when they're getting into these stress states, and that tends to happen when the executive functioning needs are higher, like becoming a parent, buying a house, planning a wedding, those types of things, the relationship gets off. <laughs> and then you, a lot of times people revert back to like, well, why can't you do this? Or you just don't care. Like a lot of fixed mindset, a lot of negative reinforcement, a lot of punishment. They're like, well, I can't like celebrate that with you because like, then it will say that this is okay. And it's like, wait, no, that, that might work for other people, but that does not work for ADHD. So how do you actually switch that? And couples are really surprised when they're like, especially the ones, the non ADHD partners that are like, if somebody did that to me, like I, that, that would be torture, right? Like, ah! <laughs> you know? and I'm just like, yeah, but that's not what your wife needs. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's so different. Like, oh my goodness, the system works. Like th when they get on board of being a supportive partner, <laughs> Um, and all ADHDers are different, but like when they know what it is, like, it's just, it's such a game changer. So it goes from like having all these like talks that you're working in through and communication and all these feelings to actually changing it. So that way you have all of a sudden these, these pain points aren't pain points anymore. Um, I mean, people are learning and growing because a lot of times like I'll sit there and say like, okay, well, well, do you not, do you not want to say like something nice, like acknowledge that they did something nice? because then you're choosing not to have a clean house, like, cause they're doing this for you. So it's your choice. Like if you want to choose your comfort of being like, I shouldn't have to say that. Like, oh, why do I have to say that? I don't need to say that. You should just do it. That's what everybody does. That's the expectation. Right. Um, you know, like I'm like, okay, but then you have to hold the responsibility that you're also choosing that, that, you know, that doing that, that's your choice for your comfort. But then you, you know, asking the other person to do this without that support when they're doing it for you, Right. And for your needs of feeling like you have to have an organized house because they might do better with more stuff everywhere because that helps their working memory. Um, you know, like I, I try to have some of that ownership or just like kind of being like, we're just talking about one minute, one minute and like making these small, small switches. It's pretty impressive that like uh, the non ADHD partner will come back and they're like, okay, I don't get it at all, but it works. Like, they're, <laughs> like, yeah, they're like, this would, I would hate this. You know, I would hate this if somebody did this to me, but like, but I like what's happening. So I guess I'll still do it. <laughs> so like, couples in that way. And, um, and then the last one is acknowledgement. So it's kind of going back to like the doctor or therapist who said, wow, you're working really hard. Um, and I think that that stems from, one, our brains work really differently. And so it's important to acknowledge our differences. And this also comes from family of origin, different cultures, different genders sometimes. You know, we all have differences that we bring to the table. And if we can hold that curiosity and connection. Um, but we also want to acknowledge the hard stuff. And so, like, so much of the struggles for ADHD of, like, what's hard for us is easy for everybody else. And what's hard for everyone else is really easy for us. Right. Um, and so I think when you switch that and you really celebrate both brains, that goes such a long way. And that heals a lot of the trauma. Like the last two really heal a lot of the, the trauma responses that have come from all the, the people who didn't get diagnosed, who got all these like negative messages and have created all these systems and internal dialogues that maybe have turned into anxiety, depression or something else, but have made it very, very challenging for them. And so those two as well, like I really like to hold hold the power of that healing, like, and how that person has that ability to, to change some of the things that were really unfair that happened to the person they loved. And then, and also too, like, if you're wanting to have kids or if you do have kids, this is really transformative, um, you know, in the way of like having your kids see how people like support each other. Like my spouse, like 
We'll read the whole manual. We'll read all the fine print. We'll fix all these things. Like I am like fascinated. And it's just like, there's just this mutual adoration that we have for each other's brains. But like, I, you know, I'm like, if I need someone to read me instructions, like he's, he's my person, you know, if he, if there's fine print, I'm like, Phew, I do not have to worry about that. And if I, if we need to get the ball rolling on something or plan an adventure, I am that person a hundred percent, which would be really challenging for him. So I think it's like a really wonderful, like strength-based relationship. And, and I mean, you can have two ADHDers that are like really amazing. It doesn't have to be this combination. It's just the patterns are so similar. Um, which is why, um, which is why I wrote the book, right? Is because the patterns are so similar. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't tell any of my clients about this because they're all going to think every single example is about them, but it's not, but it's going to feel like them, you know, like, <laughs> because it's just, it's the dynamic of not understanding executive dysfunction. And because executive dysfunction is so different for ADHD, it's not consistent. Right. Whereas like maybe somebody with depression that also impacts your executive functioning system, that's going to be at a more consistent level um, than uh, somebody who who's like has all these different areas of like, well, why do I make it? Why do I not? So those are the five that I really have as like for couples and individuals to use as their compass and like to check themselves. Right. When they are interacting, like, are they using these are, you know, five values essentially? Um, and a lot of times they're not right. They think they are, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's really fun to use like the games and the growth mindset. And it's like, you failed, you're learning, you know, like using all this different stuff. And so I really love that about the work that I do of seeing that kind of transformation. And I've gotten a lot of feedback. I've started to take new clients a, a little bit, um, cause it's been, it's been pretty shut down in the pandemic, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but it's really nice when I, I, I hear a lot of people who say like, okay, I took this course or I read this other book and it was really depressing. And your book was really like, I really appreciated the way that you wrote it. Cause it is more of a strength space. It is like, it doesn't leave the people being like, okay, I guess we just have to deal with this. And I don't know what to do with it. It, it frames it in a way of how, of empowering somebody to uh, embrace who they are, receive support how to give support. Cause what I see so much in the couples that I work with that didn't know they, that one person had ADHD, um, you know, and then we might realize it in session and switching it is that they work so hard. Like both people are working so, so, so hard, but they're doing it in a way that they're not understanding each other's brains, needs, and language. So they end up full of resentment, full of contempt, full of just like these, it, it becomes like a trauma response on both, right? It becomes this tra activated trauma response from childhood of like, oh, I'm a failure. Oh, I can't do anything right. Oh, from the ADHD -er. and then from their non-ADHD partner that they don't understand why they're going to do something. Are they not? Are they going to show up on time? Are they not? So they have their own small trauma responses that are also getting activated. And my hope is that like people miss that point, you know, and they get the stuff earlier. And that way they, they don't, they can navigate these, these kind of like little pain points a lot easier. Like it's going to be small waves, not like tsunamis. Um, and so <laughs> that's sort of, that's, that's what I, um, that's what I use. And I find that is a nice framework too, for like understanding, like, how do you set up your environment for success? Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and it's so applicable too, in terms of not just relationships, just how to communicate in general, how to communicate with ourselves, how to communicate with our children, how to, you know, really understand what it is we need. Um, oh my God. So, so just, so are you doing support groups or is it, right now it's the, it's the online course. I just want to. Oh yeah. Sure so I have an, I have this. online courses. So I've moved, I've moved my ADHD relationship boot camp, which I used to do in person online. So I have the growth mindset pillar up and I'm working on the praise pillar, which got delayed because of the everything falling apart <laughs> here in Texas, like the, the new normal here in Texas. Um, extra hard if you have a, women ADHD, <laughs> but, um, and, and I do have a uh, support groups for the non ADHD partner that follow my book. Um, and so they, we work through to like identifying, like, how do you identify, like, what is an ADHD friendly task or not? How do you make it ADHD friendly? So we not only like go over the book, but we have kind of this 
processing that can help so they don't feel so alone in all of it and understanding it. And then we also make sure that they're doing, they're getting the skills and they're practicing and bringing it back to group. And generally speaking, everyone's like, wow, it worked, you know, like, oh my goodness. And so like, um, so I offer that in the fall and the spring. Um, and so I have, those are the, the two things that I'm working on. And then I also am trying to do a little bit more for therapists. So I'm hoping um, in March that the course that I, um, that's kind of based off of a lot of the research that I did for the Chad presentation. So there's a little bit over overlap there of trauma and ADHD, because I think it's really important to also look at how AD, trauma and ADHD is so connected that it almost feels like ADHD itself. Um, and how do you understand, like, how do you work with the ADHD and then the trauma? Or like, how do you, how do you address ADHD and then anxiety and binge eating and all the other comorbidities that are there? So like, I also really kind of want to start offering more to clinicians as well, because they're the ones who like, you know, have read my book and, and love my book and recommend it. And so it, I know that like, that is like kind of my key audience. Um, mm, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I think that's so incredible. And I, you know, I feel like I, I got to my ADHD diagnosis because of my therapist who was diagnosed with ADHD because of her son. And it was sort of this passing on. Um, and, and I'm so appreciative, but I do feel like I have heard so many stories from women who came to their therapist suggesting maybe it's ADHD and the therapist being more comfortable talking about the depression and the anxiety and not having a real understanding of what's underlying that depression and really saying like, well, no, you have a business or you're in a, you know, you have a happy marriage or like all of these things that are quote unquote positive. So you can't possibly have ADHD and realizing how stigmatized and misunderstood it is, uh, you right. And then feeling like you're backed into a corner. So, right. And there's yeah. not really training in it unless you're like working with kids. Right. And so mm -hmm. like you, you look at that and it's, it's really challenging. And I'm also trying to find like occupational therapists that work with adults. So I, I'm trying to do as much sensory stuff as, and learn as much as I can, but like, I'm, that's not my field of expertise. And that's also impossible. It's like, maybe you're just going to have to go to like, you know, one that works with kids. Cause it, I think it's the same thing that like, it's, there's certifications for sensory processing that are kind of like, you get a little bit um, in that occupational therapy field. And then you, you can get a lot more of it, but like that tends to be with kids. And so it's just like all of us adults that we now are like, Oh, cause we have kids or cause you know, of uh, having more awareness, we realize this, but then there's like a huge gap in treatment. Um, because like they don't, it's, you know, they don't know what to do. And so like, uh, I, I'm glad that more therapists are, are realizing it because so many people are saying, I think I have ADHD. And then they're hearing about like, no, this is how you advocate for it. And, and same as like, when I've, I've talked to people about going to psychiatrists, I was like, these are the things that they should be checking on. This is how that if they're an ADHD friendly practice, like this is what they should be doing to support you. And that helps because a lot of times, like when it's just like those new online pop-up ones, like they, they, I'm like, I've never heard of anybody getting so little like medicine feedback, like check-ins and asking mm -hmm. questions. It's just like, how are you doing? Okay. Okay, great. I'm like, wait, no, that's not what you ask somebody with ADHD. Like, like no, that's it. And I mean, that's not, I'm not a psychiatrist, so it's not my field, but it's just like, that is an ADHD friendly support, right? That isn't ADHD informed or trauma informed in any of those mm -hmm. ways. So, um, yeah, so I'm really hoping that, that there's some big shifts uh, in our field and hopefully some more co combinations with like occupational therapists um, as well to, to, so that way we can get more comprehensive treatment. Cause I think that's what we really need. You're here. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, oh my goodness. I'm, I just, I, this has been so helpful and I know this is going to be such an incredible episode uh, for anyone who is really trying to articulate it to their partner kind of what is happening or what their needs are, because I think we're just sort of developing that understanding as we go. And so this is so incredible. So the book ADHD and us, a couple's guide to loving and living with ADHD. We can find that at your website, Anita Robertson.com. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the course, which is called ADHD relationship bootcamp. Yes. That yeah. you can access that on my course along with the, um, and non ADHD support group. And for the book, it's like in bookstores, Amazon, all of that. Uh, so you can order it wherever books are sold. <laughs>
<laughs> um, wonderful. Well, I really appreciate you sitting down and sharing some of your personal experience too. I think that's also part of that acknowledgement and validation. And we're so, we're, you know, I feel like that's something that's been interesting for me to realize how uh, validation is such a big part of this treatment plan for ADHD, mm -hmm. which is sharing our stories and realizing that we're not the only ones who are experiencing this. And, you know, and even like, I think about being a new parent, right? And like, when I was first going, when I, when my babies were tiny, like Facebook groups were a lifesaver because it was that same is this normal? Is this normal? Is anyone else experiencing this? Is this color of poop normal? Like, right, like all of that. But it was really just feeling like I'm not alone in this and that I'm, you know, some other people are experiencing that. And I feel like that's such a huge part of our self, you know, self discovery journey with this diagnosis. So, yeah, yeah. I agree. Agree. <laughs> I was in all the Facebook groups. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think that that it's so true because there's just like so much information that isn't told. Like, I was like, hey, how's it like? Well, give me some tips. What is this like motherhood, parenthood thing like? It's like, they're like, oh, it's hard, but it's great. And you're like, wait, hold on. <laughs> I need details. <laughs> I did not get this consent form. Like, what, do you, what is this? <laughs> so, so anyways, yes, I, I agree that the validation, which it goes into the pillar of acknowledgement is, is so crucial and so transformative on so many levels, not just from like people within the ADHD community, but people outside of it too. Uh, yeah, right. Um, and I also think about my husband who, when he makes dinner, he, at the end, he asks, he's like, all I ask for return is that you give me compliments. And so we joke where he's, he's like, my window for compliments has opened. <laughs> that reminded me of that when you were talking about praise. He's just like, so unabashed about it. He's like, come on, I need it. This is how you feed me. <laughs> I know. That's great. That's amazing. I love that. Like, I love yeah. that story because like, then it's just, it's like, well, okay, when we know our needs, then we know how to meet them. And we also know how to set boundaries around it of like, I can't give this to you. Like, it's not that one person has to give you all your praise needs, but then you're able to like, learn how to get that from everybody else too. So I think that's like mm -hmm. really important because our brains are wired for reward and that makes us do so many amazing things like start podcasts and start new businesses and like have all these creative ideas. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's important to know what's driving it. So that way it is values based and it is like something that you're wanting and, and getting your needs met in a healthy way versus like kind of, you know, just if you're hungry and you're just eating junk food, it might work, but it's just, it's not going to make you feel good long-term. Mm, yeah. Well, Anita, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, your time. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I hope to see you at the next, uh, chat conference. Oh yeah. Right.